Hello, this is Gerald Sutherland, my wife Linda. We're from the Word of Faith Fellowship in Spindale, North Carolina. We'd like to welcome you to our program today, whether you're listening on the radio or watching us on the internet. We're so grateful you came to be with us. We just came to share some things with you today from the Word of God that have touched our hearts and have changed our lives and have helped us through a lot of circumstances and situations down through the years. Linda, I felt led this morning to begin the program by reading out of Hebrews chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, open them up with me to Hebrews chapter 3. I'll be reading from the Amplified Version and beginning with verse 7. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as happened in the rebellion of Israel and their provocation and embitterment of me in the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tried my patience, God said, and tested my forbearance, and found I stood their test, and they saw my works forty years. And so I was provoked, displeased, and sorely grieved with that generation, and said they always err and are led astray in their hearts, and they have not perceived or recognized my ways, and become progressively better and more experimentally and intimately acquainted with them. Accordingly, I swore in my wrath and indignation, God said, they shall not enter into my rest. And verse 12 says, Therefore beware, brethren, that's us, take care lest there be in any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart which refuses to cleave to, to trust in and rely on him, leading you to turn away and desert or stand aloof from the living God. I believe that the worst sin of the human race is not murder, it's not adultery, it's not stealing, it's not lying. It's unbelief. The sin of unbelief. And here God calls it a wicked heart Mm -hmm. of unbelief. A lot of people may think that unbelief is not believing anything, but that's not truth. We all believe something. Even atheists, atheists who claim to believe that there's no God, they still have a belief system, and that belief system is that there is no God. So unbelief is not just not believing anything. It's believing the wrong Wrong thing. thing. And that's what happened to the children of Israel when they were not allowed to go into the promised land, not because they didn't believe anything, but because they believed the wrong thing. They didn't believe that God meant what he said. They did not abide by what God promised them. In fact, the last, in verse 19 of that same chapter says, So we see that they were not able to enter into his rest because of their unwillingness to adhere to, trust in, and rely on God. And then it says, Unbelief had shut them out. And we're not here today to share with you about what unbelief is, because I think we're all quite acquainted with unbelief. But we're here to share with you today what it means to believe God, to trust in Him and rely on Him. There's a scripture over in John 4 that I go back and I read frequently. It's one of my favorites. But in the first part of the chapter, of the fourth chapter of John, he's talking, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, And he begins to tell her uh, by the Spirit of God what's gone on in her life. And the lady was absolutely astonished at what Jesus was saying to her. But we know that she did believe because of what Jesus told her and what he said to her. And as a result of that, she went and gathered all her friends and they believed. But they came and they heard what Jesus said for themselves. And they told her, said, now we believe not because of what you said, but we believe because of what we've heard Jesus personally ourselves. And Jesus wants every one of us to hear him and believe in him. But here in verse 46, Jesus is coming back into Galilee, and he's in the city of Cana uh, of Galilee, where he turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son was lying ill in Capernaum. And so this royal official comes to Jesus. Apparently, this 
official had heard of Jesus and maybe seen what he did. And so he comes to him when his little child was sick. And having heard that Jesus had come back from Judea into Galilee, he went away to meet him and began to beg him to come down and cure his son, for he was lying at the point of death. Now here was a little boy lying at the point of death. Here was his father, very concerned, very upset, but he heard and knew about Jesus. And so then Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and miracles happen, you people never will believe and trust and have faith at all. But this did not deter this royal official. It says the king's officer pleaded with him, Sir, do come down at once before my little child is dead. Before the child is dead, please come down. He had faith. He believed that if Jesus came, then his son could be healed. And Jesus answered him, Go in peace. Your son will live. And the man put his trust in what Jesus said and started home. I mean, you just think there are many things have hit the mind of that officer, that royal official, about his child. And it was his child, not just somebody he knew about. It was his child. But he didn't. He believed what Jesus said. Enough to turn and start back down the road to where he lived which was evidently a good little journey. But as he went on his journey, this is what happened. So he asked, um, but even as he was on the road going down, his servants met him and reported saying, your son lives. They confirmed that what Jesus said and what this man had believed was true. So he asked them at what time he had begun to get better. They said yesterday during the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew it was at that very hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he and his entire household believed, trusted in, and relied on Jesus. I mean, that one thing, and it caused many, many people to believe, but it took one man who had heard about Jesus. Maybe he had even seen him before. It does not say. But he had enough there to when his son was at the point of death, he knew he had to get to Jesus, and it turned his whole life around. But the, the phrase that so struck me, the man put his trust in what Jesus said and turned and went, showing that he believed what Jesus just said to him. You know, that was a choice. It was. It was a decision that man had to make, whether he was going to believe what Jesus said or whether he was going to believe what the thoughts were, what he saw, the physical evidence, what other people were saying about his son. But he made that decision, that is what I'm going to believe. That's right. That's right. He had that in his heart so deep that when it came down to it, and we've all had, as parents, we've had our children uh, in the middle of the night, the midnight hour, or maybe it's during the day, come home from school, with things wrong with their bodies. Physically, things happen. And you know how it tugs on your heart when you see your that child not feeling well. And you can imagine with this father here, with a child who is dying, and yet Jesus was the answer, just like he is today. And he chose, like you said, to believe him. And that natural evidence there was that his child was dying. Right. He Somehow he knew that by all evidence, by all natural evidence, his child was dying. But then when the word of the Lord came through Jesus, he chose to believe that word. That's right. That's so important for us to understand that a belief system in God and trusting in God and relying on God is a decision that we make based on what God has spoken. It comes by hearing The word of the Lord, whether it's spoken directly from God to our hearts, spoken to us through one of God's ministers, or anyone that we might come in contact with that would know God and would have the word of the Lord. Right. In Matthew chapter 14, if you want to turn there with me, there is an account here of Jesus with his disciples. He'd been ministering to the people, had fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, But in in verse 22, it says, Then he directed the disciples, chapter 14 of Matthew, to get into the boat and go before him to the other side. 
while he sent away the crowds. And after he had dismissed the multitudes, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was still there alone. But the boat was by this time out on the sea, many furlongs. And the furlong was about one-eighth of a mile in distance from the land, beaten and tossed by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch between 3 and 6 a.m. of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. Walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they screamed out with fright. But instantly he spoke to them saying, Take courage. I am. Stop being afraid. That's so important. Stop being afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, as Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, and he came toward Jesus. So important. He heard a word from Jesus that said, come. To him, that was God speaking through Jesus, giving him the ability to step over the corner, over the edge of that boat, and begin to walk on the water. I'm sure he must not have taken thought about it, but he instantly obeyed what the word of the Lord was to him. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, and he came toward Jesus. But when he perceived, that's a natural evidence, and he felt the strong wind, that's a natural evidence, he was frightened, and as he began to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Save me from death. He saw the natural evidence. He felt the wind. He saw the waves. He was familiar with what could happen to someone on that lake because he'd fished there all of his life. Right. So he knew the natural, in the way of natural thinking of what he was doing was not possible. But he cried out, Lord, save me from death. Instantly, Jesus reached out his hand and called him and held his hand and, and held it and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Have you ever asked yourself that question? God, why did I doubt you? After all those times I've prayed and I've asked you for things, I've asked you to do things for me, and you did them, why is it that I still doubt? And that's where God's dealing with every single one of us. Not just us who are sitting here sharing with you today, but those of you that are watching or that are listening to this program today. God's asking you, why do you doubt? What does God have to do? How many things does he have to do to prove to us that he is real and that he loves us, that he wants to be a blessing to us? I was thinking the other day about 2 Kings chapter 5. Let's turn there. 2 2 Kings chapter 5. This is a powerful example of what we're talking about today in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 5 is talking about a man who was a commander in the Syrian army. His name was Naaman. And most of you are familiar with this story, but Naaman was a powerful man and he was in good standing with his ruler. And but he was a leper. A leper meaning he had an incurable disease and a communicable disease, one that was contagious. But the little maiden girl, the little Israelite girl, heard that what was going on with her master, and she sent word if he went to where I'm from, from Israel, to the prophet of God, the prophet would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman went. After getting his commander's orders, he went to see the, the prophet of God. And when he got there, he was expecting the prophet to come out and wave his hand over him and and tell him that he was healed of his leprosy. But he didn't. The prophet said, Behold, go and wash in the the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away. Why? Mm -hmm. Because that wasn't what he was expecting. How many times that happened to you and I? When we ask God for something and what God does doesn't seem like that was what we asked for. But God had something better in mind for us. So Naaman said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leper. 
And he thought about the rivers that he came from in Syria. And he said, Are not Abana and Tharpor the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I, not, may I not go wash in one of those rivers? Why do I have to wash in this river? You see the natural reasoning that he went to. And his servants came near and said to him, My father, if the prophet had bid you do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather then when he says to you, Wash and be clean. So Naaman listened to them, and he obeyed. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, as the man of God had said, and his flesh was restored like that, that of a little child, and he was clean. And then Naaman returned to the man of God, and he, he and all of his company had stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. What a testimony. Yes. This wicked Syrian ruler heard from God, and when he obeyed God, just simple obedience to God Believing that. changed the whole circumstance. Right. Is that right. something else? Oh, I was thinking about, you know, the, the examples we've given here have been in the area of healing, but believing God is not just in that area. Uh, through our lives and our lives in the ministry, we've had many occasions for to believe God every day, every part of the day, and one time I, we were looking for a house when we moved to Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, there were many houses available. We looked at maybe over 20 houses and nothing seemed to be right. We just didn't have that witness that this is the one that Jesus was saying. And so one morning the realtor that we were working with called us and said, there's a house that's about to go on the market. It's for lease. It's not for sale, but it's for lease. And I just thought you might want to look at it. So we said, yes, we will. So we made an appointment that day, that morning, to go and see the house. The realtor met us at the house, but something was wrong with the lockbox, and we couldn't get in, so we had to wait to come back until about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But when we drove up in front of that house, we didn't get to go in at that time. There was God speaking, that's your house. Now, we hadn't seen the inside of the house, didn't really know how many rooms it had, didn't know the decor, was the carpet going to flow with our furniture, with the walls, this terrible looking color, all these things that could have hit your mind. But because God spoke, not anything on our parts, but because God spoke, we could believe and hold on to that. It didn't touch me about, well, what about this and what about that? No, God spoke. And I believe there what was, he said. There was such an assurance and a confidence in our hearts. There was peace. Right. We didn't know how it could work. I don't know if even at that time he told us what it was going to cost us. No, but we, when we, he asked us to move, the reason we moved and were even looking for a house was because God said, yes. I want you to move to Greenville and do this, this, and this. And so he told us over in Mark, the 10th chapter, that anybody that gives up, in other words, leaves where they are, leaves whatever behind, whether it's parents, children, whether it's a house you really love, uh, the area you really like, when you do, but that he will give you many fold back in return for that. And so we knew if God told us to move, he had a house for us. He had a place for us to live. So that's where we could always go back and anchor ourselves. When it looked like nothing was happening, we could go back and say, but God said. And we had two small children, and we were staying in the home with your mom and dad. Right. Which was a very small house. And I don't know how many weeks it was. It was several weeks. Several weeks that we, I mean, nothing was happening. The realtor, he had nothing. But God was proving our hearts. Our hearts. Yeah. Were we going to hold on? Were we going to really believe, trust, and rely on Him? Not what it looked like, not what the real estate market was at the time, all of these things, but what God said. And it so happened that when we got in that house, it was, Everything. we didn't even know what we needed, yes. what we were going to have to use for the ministry and different things. But God knew. And everything that we had need of, God already had provided in that house. And, and the money flowed. that it cost us to live there <laughs> on a monthly basis 
was absolutely astronomical to us. If I told you what it was today, you'd think, well, that was nothing. But back then, it was a lot of money. Yeah. And we never missed a payment. No. And God it really, always provided. I can honestly say it didn't really touch us about the money. Because if God's going to give you a house, he's gonna pay surely for it. he's going to give you the money right. to pay for it. Yes. Another scripture I had over in Mark 5, and this is another scripture concerning uh, healing, but a ruler of the synagogue, Jairus by name, came to Jesus and told him that his little daughter was at the point of death, another child. He was begging Jesus, come to my house. And Jesus said, I will. But on the way to get there, he had a lot of delays. And one of them was stopping and healing a lady who had had an issue of blood for several years. And so Jesus is taking care of that situation. People are talking to him and everything. And while he was speaking, there came from the ruler's house who said to Jairus, your daughter has died. Don't bother Jesus any further. She's dead. She's Natural gone. Natural evidence again. That's right. But Jesus said, overhearing but ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be seized with alarm and struck with fear. Only keep on believing. And one thing we need to point out is that fear will absolutely destroy faith. It will remove you from a place of faith to a place of fear, and it's no longer believing in God and trusting in God. That's right. It negates the faith of God. So when Jesus turned to this ruler and said this, I mean, he evidently took hold of it. And Jesus even had to take some of the people and put them out of the house because he said, don't be concerned about this. You know, she's going to wake up from the sleep of death. And they just scorned him, jeered at him, laughed at him, like he didn't know what he was talking about. But once he got the unbelief out of the house, then those that did believe joined their faith with Jesus. And the little girl was healed and got up and was walking around, gave her something to eat. So we need to see that no matter what happens, that tries to come against and disprove what Jesus has said to you. He says, only keep on believing. And lest anyone would say or even have the thought, well, yeah, but that was in Jesus' day. That was when Jesus was here on the earth. It's not the same thing today. We have this problem, that problem. Uh, you know, we have a lot of divisiveness going on in our country now, uh, politically and otherwise. And people are so distraught and so unsettled about what's going to happen, what's going to happen. And yet the Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 13, I believe verse 8, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you can't partmentalize God and you can't say, well, that was then and this is now. No, he is the same. He is the same God. Jesus is the same Lord today as he was then. And whatever he would do then, he will do now. That's right. The Bible says he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Well, God's still with him. That's right. And again, a personal testimony. This was years ago. It was not long after we were both born again. And I heard a testimony of a lady on the radio of where Jesus had healed her of a certain ailment in her back. And I thought, I had the same thing that was going on with me. So that night I got in the bed and I said, Jesus, you heal that lady. You know what I have. I just believe you that you're going to heal my back. I don't know when you're going to do it, but I believe you will. Went to sleep, woke up the next morning. It was gone. Never, never had it again. Never to this day had that again. Just by what well, I heard what someone said, but then I wanted to see. I was putting my faith out there. Yes, God will do it for me. He's no respecter of persons. What he's done for us, he'll do for you. He'll do so much, whatever it is that we need in our life. Only believe. We've had a lot of experiences like that, not only with ourselves, but with people that we've known. I remember years ago, there was a lady in our church who called me in the middle of the night and she was screaming and she said, my house is on fire, my house is on fire. And I got up quickly, got dressed, and went to where she lived. 
and stood there with her and watched as this house completely destroyed everything she had. And, you know, what you say, well, what do you say to somebody in a time like that? I can assure you I, I had no idea what to say to her, but I was trusting and relying on Jesus to give me the words of encouragement. And I spoke to her that day, that morning, there in the middle of the night, and I told her, I said, if you will not give over to fear and doubt and unbelief, God will restore everything to you that you've lost in this fire. And I don't remember all the circumstances and the specifics of what happened, but I can assure you God restored yes, every single thing that she had lost in that fire because God is faithful to his promises. That's right. That, that is so important for us to understand. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, let's turn there if you have your Bible, Hebrews 11, because it talks about faith. It describes what faith is, and that's what we're talking about today. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith, let me go back there. Now faith is the assurance. It is the confirmation. It is the title deed of the things we hope for. What is it that we're hoping for? What are you hoping for today? What are you hoping for to happen? What are you trusting God to bring to pass? Is it a broken marriage? Is it a rebellious child? Is it a, a financial lack? Is it not having a job? What is the problem today? Faith is having the assurance in your heart, the confirmation. It's almost like having the title deed to something. You don't have the object itself, but you have the title deed to prove that it belongs to you. Well, we have that, don't we? We have God's Word, not only the written Word, but God's spoken Word. Right. He said it's being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith is perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. In other words, it does not yield to, to natural reasoning. It's only that God spoke this to your heart and you know that God has a plan to bring it to pass. That's so important for us to, to, to get a hold of, that there is a place in God where we can trust him. That, that 11th chapter of Hebrews talks about uh, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all who were people of faith. You just think about Noah and all of the years that it took him to build that ark, and he had to believe what God said to him. You go back to Genesis in chapter 6, and, and God told him that everybody was so depraved, it was so terrible, he was going to send some fl a flood, and it was going to wipe everybody out except for him and his family. It had never rained before. And he didn't know anything about an ark, but God gave him those instructions. He followed it, and because he did, I mean, he and his family, the animals, and all that plan of God was saved. And it didn't all come to pass for a hundred years. Right. And so he had to believe. He kept on believing. Kept on build, uh, believing, kept on building, because God said. And that's so important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it tells us that God is faithful. I'm going to turn there quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It tells us in the last part of that verse, but God is faithful. I love that, don't you? Mm -hmm. But God is faithful to his word and to his compassionate nature, right. and he can be trusted. I'm going to say that again. God can be trusted. He can be trusted with our lives. He can be trusted with our circumstances, no matter what's going on. And also back in that first chapter of 1 Corinthians, it tells us in verse 9 that God is faithful, <coughs> God is reliable, He's trustworthy, and therefore ever true to His promise, and He can be depended on. That's so good, so good. So we want to keep <coughs> encouraging you, you know, no, no matter what you're facing, no matter what your situation is today, God has an answer for it, and He can be trusted with it. So keep turning to Him. Keep looking to him. Keep calling on his name, and you will see the results. We so appreciate you joining with us today to hear the things that God has put on our hearts. and We endeavor to live by these promises, by the Word of God, every day, and we encourage you to do that. Trust and rely on him. Now, I what just what we call the big things, but every circumstance. Everyday things. Everyday things that we face in our lives. 
God bless you and have a wonderful day and we love you.